All right, Psalm 33. Let's dig right in. There's a lot of content in this psalm that I want to get to. Verse number one, the Bible reads, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. And, you know, again, we're reading through the book of Psalms. We're studying the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is a song book, and these are all meant to be sung. Uh, even though it is the Word of God, it is the Word of God that is put to music and that is in the form of a song. Whether or not we know how they originally sung doesn't matter. It's still the Word of God. But understanding that this is also a songbook is important. The Bible says here, rejoice in the Lord. Or we have lots of reason to, to, that the Lord brings joy to us, that we should rejoice in the Lord. O ye righteous, says, praise is comely for the upright. What, that word comely means it's appropriate. Right? It's, it's something that the upright should be doing. We ought to be praising the Lord. Right? It's something that, that we as, as you know, um, saved believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to be praising God. It's the right thing to do. And when we, you know, it's one of the reasons why we have singing as part of the church service. And congregational singing ought to be done by the entire congregation. Everybody ought to be participating in the singing. It's not one of those things that you should go to church and be like, well, I just don't really like to sing that much, so I'm not going to sing. I'm just going to go and listen to the preaching. You're missing out on a major part of the church service. And think about God. I mean, don't you have reason to rejoice? Don't you have a reason to praise the Lord? I mean, don't you at least have the respect to God? Do you want to show him that you love him and that you're thankful for all that he does for you to, to, to offer up your praise unto him? Right? And that's what righteous singing is, by the way. It's not to be heard of men or seen of men. It's not to show off and let everyone know how great of a singer you are. It's for you to open up your mouth and from your heart sing praise unto the Lord. That's what the singing is all about, and that's the singing that glorifies God. And we all ought to be singing from our heart. And I love hearing, and there's people I hear that, that sing it out, and I really do believe they take it to heart. And that makes my heart rejoice just being in church when I hear other people singing out. I love hearing that. Amen. And you know what? I don't care if they have the best voice or not. That's not as important to me. I love hearing the sound of someone who loves God sing out to the Lord. And the reason why I'm even saying this is because, you know, you have to also understand that it's not even just for the Lord. He is the, the, the ultimate object and, and the, you know, of our praise and the main reason for doing it, but also the blessing that other people receive by being a part of that singing and hearing other people. It is an encouraging thing. It's a beautiful thing. And, and you are ministering and helping others whether or not you realize it when you're singing out to the Lord. So keep singing. <laughs> Verse number two. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. And I'm really glad that uh, Brother Peter, I didn't even talk to him about the songs, that he chose Psalm 150 to sing tonight. Because there's a, there's a subject that I'm going to dig into a little bit, not maybe quite as much as I may like to. It's, it's worthy of it's his own sermon uh, completely. And it, is, it has to do with the subject of music and it has to do with actually the subject of musical instruments and just kind of music in general. What we see in this psalm is certain instruments being referenced in verse number two. Now, there's other psalms that do this as well. And I kind of was deciding when I wanted to preach on this subject since it is mentioned in other places of the Bible. But um, I don't think this is going to be mentioned again before I stop or put on pause my psalm series and go on to another book. So uh, I want to handle it right now. But there's a few different, another reason I'm teaching this is, you know, doctrinally, there's some people who have some weird beliefs out there. There's some people who believe like that, there's, that in New Testament churches that you shouldn't have any musical instruments. Now tonight we sang a cappella. Yeah. Right? We didn't have any musical instruments here. But the reason for that is because our attendance is light and the people within our church that are capable of playing musical instruments aren't here tonight. <laughs> we, have, we have a piano. We also have someone who plays guitar. There's even a person that, that plays cello sometimes when they're here. So, you know, we love the instruments, and I believe in having musical instruments as part of the church service, even in a New Testament church. And, you know, the, you, 
<laughs> you may or may not believe this, but one of the reasons there's some people out there that believe that there should be no musical instruments in church is, is the reason how they could come up with that. You say, well, Pastor how could they even come up with that? We're looking at the Psalms right here. It says, praise the Lord with harp. Why, why would we not use musical instruments when this is like in, an imperative statement saying, praise the Lord with harp. That's like, you do that. That's how you do it. Right? It's one of the ways that you do. Sing on him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. So why would you not do that when the Bible's saying directly to do those things? And the only argument I've really heard about, and there may be others, I've never spent much time in it because, honestly, it's, it's a really foolish thing. I don't spend a whole lot of time on, on things that are just so weird and out there. You know, other doctrines I'll get to know a little bit better to see where people are coming from with it, especially to be able to then combat false doctrine and be able to expose it. But, you know, something like this, I haven't spent a whole lot of time in. But basically what people say is just that, well, you don't see any musical instruments in the New Testament. So they build a doctrine based on a lack of evidence. And when you start doing that, when you start looking at a, 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 what, what something doesn't say to form what you believe, you're going to run into a lot of problems because if you're consistent with that, you could come up with all kinds of doctrines because you could just say, well, the Bible doesn't say that. Or I don't see that here. I don't, you know, it's like, hold, hold on a second. <laughs> now you've just gone into just whatever you can come up with that the Bible doesn't say and start forming doctrines off that. It's not the way you form good doctrine. You form doctrine off what the Bible says, not off what it doesn't say. We have very clear the Bible saying here, praise the Lord with harp. That's pretty clear. I, mean, there, so, I don't see there's any other way to interpret that other than, hey, we should be using some musical instruments to praise the Lord, right? That's what this song is about. Hey, praise God. It's, 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 you're, you're adding to the music and to the singing and to the praise and the worship of the Lord by adding extra things and adding these instruments. It's making it more grandiose. It's making it more marvelous. It's making it better a better sound, a more full, complete sound to send up to God in praise and worship to the Lord. It's a great thing to have. Now, um, I mean, even in the New Testament, though, you say, well, it's not mentioned, but the Bible does say to sing unto yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So if we're singing to ourselves in psalms, why would God want us in the New Testament singing about using instruments, but then not using the instruments? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Right? It makes no sense. So again, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I do want to spend a little bit of time on some of these instruments that are brought up and a little bit about music in general. This is an important topic to me. Music's a big part of my life. It always has been. I love music. And for a long stretch of my life, there's been a, a large period of time where I listen to bad music. I listen to really worldly music and just real bad music. And I want to explain a little bit about the difference between the two. But I also... Um, don't want to build doctrine. I don't, I don't build doctrines just based off of, just solely based off of like experience or anecdotal evidence of just things that happened in my life. I'm going to base them off of the Bible and off of truth. So one thing we see here is definitely instruments being used to praise God. That is a scriptural thing. Okay. Now it lists particular types of instruments. However, when the instruments are listed, and, and there's a few examples, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the references for these. Uh, you, could, you could look at Psalm 150 if you'd like. If you want to turn it, you could pick up one of those sheets that are, that are next to you if you want to use that. But um, I'm going to read from 1 Chronicles 15 and 1 Chronicles 16. 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 16, the Bible says, And David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music, psalteries and harps and cymbals sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. So this usage of music was amplified with King David. King David had a love for music and started adding the, to the service, to the worship of the Lord, actually to people's jobs, to the Levites' jobs, this aspect of being, you know, men singers and women singers and, and um, players, you know, players of, of music. One of the reasons for that is because when the temple was being built, when, the, when the, the service of the Lord shifted from the tabernacle to the temple, 
the Levites were responsible for the tabernacle, for, its set, for the rearing up and taking down, you know, when they were moving and doing everything. There was, different, there was different groups of the Levites that had charge over different areas of service, right? So you have the priests that were offering up sacrifice. You have Levites that were doing different jobs and different functions, especially with the maintenance of the tabernacle. When you move to a temple, those jobs no longer become necessary of the taking down and putting up. You can still have some jobs of maintaining the temple, but it's not going to be the same as everything else with the altar. So he makes these jobs, these new jobs, where now they're going to be in music service and they're going to be, you know, singing and using these instruments in worship to the Lord. Now, this is completely biblical, even though David kind of added this and came up with this. It's with the Lord's blessing. OK, God didn't tell him not to do it. And God gave him the blessing to allow this and to have this in his service. And when you look and, and again, I, I, if I was taking more time, I would give you more of the evidence and more of the proof of this. But like in heaven, we know that there's creatures that are basically created to be singing praise unto the Lord at all times. That's right. Just all the time, there's praise going on in heaven before the Lord. Amen. So patterning things in heaven here on earth is a biblical concept, especially when it comes to things like the temple and the mercy seat and the holiest of holies and all this stuff. They're patterning things that are in heaven. And that's what the ark, the, 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 excuse me, the... Um, the tabernacle did. It was patterned off heavenly things. And then a lot of those, those things transferred into the temple too. So th this patterning of things in heaven makes sense when you see what's going on here. Now we do have scriptures that say that David like added basically new musical instruments too. Now because of that, I, I am not adamant that particular musical instruments are inherently bad or wrong. I do not hold that view. There's some people that will say that drums, for existence, are a bad, like a bad instrument and that you shouldn't play them. And one of the reasons, again, which I don't like this line of proof, is they'll say, well, it's not found in Scripture. Just because something's not found, I don't think it's, it's you know, something that you can just hang your head on and say, well, see, then it must be bad. There's nowhere the Bible saying that's bad. And there's nowhere where you can find in the Bible where saying this musical instrument is not good. It's not right. What they do is they say, well, you know, there's a lot of, you know, false religion and tribes and they use the drums to kind of get themselves worked up into a trance and they use it, you know, in their, in their worship of their gods and stuff. And that may be true, okay? And it's not something to just completely ignore, but at the same time, I can't make a biblical argument saying that um, they are just inherently bad. And another reason why I don't think they're just inherently bad as an instrument, even though they're not listed, is because music itself, when you're playing music, is going to have, it tends to have a, an inherent beat to it anyways right and i know there's different styles of music but when you have that in your even in your good music which i believe the hymns that we sing are good music you have that inherently in there so i don't think that that alone is what makes music bad but i do believe that there is such a thing as bad music regardless of the lyrics regardless of what is actually spoken I do believe the right music and wrong. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Before we get there, I want to finish with looking at the instruments that are listed here in Scripture. So David appointing, and I got this from 1 Chronicles 15, verse 16. David, you know, appointing the Levites to be singers with instruments, psalteries, harps, cymbals, uh, sounding by lifting up the voice of joy. And then First Chronicles 16, verse 42, the Bible says, And with them Heman and Jeduthun, with trumpets and cymbals, for those that should make a sound, and with musical instruments of God, and the sons of Jeduthun were porters. So as he's giving out the jobs, you know, you're a porter, you're a doorman, and you've also got these people with the musical instruments. It, it mentions trumpets, cymbals. We saw psalteries and harps. You know, those are um, stringed instruments. And then we also are going to see organs. So in Psalm 150, verse 3, the Bible says, Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high-sounding cymbals. So 
all of those instruments, I think you could clearly say, are just fine to use in worship of the Lord. And if you wanted to err on the side of caution, I would say, well, maybe there's no need to have drums anyways or whatever. But I can't just dogmatically say that it's a bad instrument. And especially when you see that David did add some instruments. So it's kind of like they weren't inherently bad. And I'd be open to hear some other arguments against drums. Other, like, I haven't heard anything that's more, that that's actually has more scriptural backing to it other than just kind of looking and applying it at things. Now again, it's not like it's the worst evidence either because here's the thing, the, the other way that we have to read the Bible and interpret it and understand it is that the Bible isn't going to explicitly mention every single thing and every possibility in the world. It gives us principles though that we use to apply to specific situations and circumstances to determine and judge whether it's right or wrong. So if you see, you know, the fruit of something just being bad all the time, it's pretty safe to say then that's probably a bad thing, right? So I'm not, again, I'm not trying to just completely knock that argument of people who are against, you know, drums being used in a church service or in worship to God and, you know, and saying praise the Lord. But at the same time, I, don't, I still don't see as much compelling evidence for that either, just because of inherent beat that can be found in good music to the Lord. So um, that's kind of where I stand on that, but it's something to consider. And it's something, it's also just, an, if nothing else, another lesson to how we all ought to be looking at everything in our life and just kind of examining, is this right by God? You know, maybe things that you wouldn't consider that, that God cares about. I, I think there's probably a lot, there's a lot of things that he does and you just may not even think about it very much, but take the time to study it out and think about it and say, you know, I'll be right with God. And for me, this is important because I love music so much. So I want to be right with God as much as possible um, and not leave any stone unturned and not think like, well, wait a minute. You know, is this, what's right? What's the truth? And let's use the scripture to lead us into that truth. Uh, I'm going to read again here from 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 11, the Bible reads, And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified, and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them in 120 priests, sounding with trumpets. What, I mean, before I even go any further, just think about this host. This is, this is a great, what this must have sounded like, to have 120 priests 120, I mean, it's a, think about how many trumpets, that's a lot of trumpets sounding, 120. In addition to then the cymbals, psalteries, and harps by these other Levites that are also going to be playing to the Lord and having such a, a great assembly with this music being played. And it says in verse 13, and it came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one. So they're making this, this noise in unison, this beautiful noise unto the Lord, this beautiful sound, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. So we very clearly see that God is pleased with this effort, with these people bringing their instruments and playing and making one sound in unison and singing praise to the Lord that God actually comes down and fills the house of the Lord with his, with his glory, just, just, just his brightness coming out of the house of the Lord that the priests, they can't even like be in there to minister to, to do their work. They're like, they've got to, 
be out because it's just filled with God's glory. And um, that's the result of all of this music and praise to the Lord. So no doubt about it that, that using instrumentation and music and you know, to, to praise the Lord with is a very good thing and something that we ought to have more of in church. Now, again, we've got a pretty small church and we've got some people who are musically talented here. Um, I know there's other people who are learning and more, and I encourage you, you know, if you're trying to figure out some areas, what can I do? What can I do to miss? Or what can I, you know, if you've got the time and the inclination, try seeing if God's blessed you with musical talent and ability. And don't just try it for a week and say, oh, well, I'm just no good at it. I must not be able to do it. You know, I think anyone, almost anyone should be able to pick up, you know, playing an instrument or something. It may be a little bit more work than it is for some other people, but um, you'll be able to do it and do it well. And, um, and that, that's going to, that makes God happy. And, and you know, it, it is a blessing to other people. It's not something that's just frivolous or extra. This is, I mean, this is something that when they did it, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Seems pretty cool to me. It sounds like something that God enjoys. And, you know, we are here as his creation for him, for his pleasure. That's why we're here. So it uh, makes sense, again, to follow that path. I had to turn to 1 John chapter 2. This is the principle that I use, as I mentioned before. You know, the Bible doesn't always explicitly tell you every single thing and just have a whole list of all the possible things in the world that could possibly be right or wrong, but it gives us principles to use. About all music being fine, is it just the lyrics that are bad, or is it more to it than that? And the, one of the reasons why I believe that it's more than just what's being spoken is one because there is a spirit to music and i don't mean uh, like a, a ghost type of a spirit like an apparition i mean a feel and a power and a presence in a way to music and I, the, the best way, you know, I preached a sermon before about the power of music, and that's probably the best way I could describe it, is that music is powerful enough to be able to impact your soul and impact you and impact your movement and impact how you behave just by music. There's certain music that you can listen to that will calm you down. That the music itself, if you are agitated, if you're irritated, if you're angry, and if you let yourself listen to certain types of music, will impact your emotion and your, your physical body and, and lower your maybe anger level, things like that. There's other music that you can listen to that could increase your agitation, that could make you more hyper, maybe, that could give you more energy, that can cause you to to be more in a, in a state of mind that's, that's confrontational. There's other types of music that can make you want to move your body a certain way, right? Maybe up and down or whatever. You know, there's, there's different types of dancing. I mean, think about like hip hop and the beats and the things that go along with that type of music. And when people are dancing on a dance floor, the, the, type, the styles of music, while you may have some individuality in general, People are kind of doing the same things with their bodies to the flow of that music. The music is influencing you and causing you to move your bodies a certain way. I mean, what is it, metal? You're going to get your head going up and down, right? Where the headbangers come from. Why does that even become a thing? Is it because people just want to injure their necks and have whiplash? No. It became a thing because that's part of what the music is doing to you because you've, you've got these guys on stage that as they're playing their instruments, their body's kind of going into that, just, just doing what the music is guiding you into. And then other people are, are you know, kind of going into the same thing. Look, I, we could go on and on about what the difference, like, it's a real thing. It's a real phenomenon. Music is very powerful. While, yes, the lyrics are extremely important, you ought to be looking at lyrics, and if you've got bad lyrics, then toss that out and don't let... Because, because here's the thing with music, with how powerful it is, 
I know what it's like to love music, to have music have a pull on you, almost like a drug. It could be an addiction to where you just want to hear, like you're craving to hear certain music. And it's not as much because of the lyrics. The lyrics are just kind of there. You love the music. I mean, I know that's how it was for me. I loved hearing that music, all of it together, combined. You got a drummer and a guitarist or whatever, you know, whatever type of music you, 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 know, you really get into. And the lyrics may be cool. Or you may like the lyrics, but like it's that, that musical power is that draw. And then what the lyrics do is that gets into your head to get that message in that they're trying to get in. And every so-called artist or musical artist, they have a message to tell you. And when you look at today's musical artists, they're not good messages. You can look at, one, how they live their life and what they're all about and what they support and all the garbage and nonsense they support and the super liberal ideas, the ideologies, the communism and the, and the socialism and all this other junk that they subscribe to is being inserted into your brain through their music. Obviously, the lyrics is his own thing, but I would say even beyond just the lyrics, the music itself is powerful enough that you can't just say it's all benign and it's all harmless and unless you add lyrics, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't believe that. I don't believe that because when music has an influence and power over you to make your body start doing things, even without having any lyrics in them, you got to be aware of that power. What is it causing you to do? And is it good or is it bad? Is it going to be something righteous or unrighteous? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Look at what the Bible says. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So the Bible is teaching us, instructing us that we're not supposed to love the world and we're not supposed to love the things that the world produces. Now, anything that's not of the Father is inherently of the world. And it lists three things here, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life as being things that are of the world. I would put music in the category of the lust of the flesh because gratifying and appealing to your flesh to hear that music and to get you going or whatever it is, that, that, that connection that you feel, that lust, it's, it's this feeling that you have kind of like any other lustly, fleshly feeling that you may want to gratify, whether it's something of a, like a fornication type of a lust or adultery type of a lust, that's a fleshly lust. That's a desire that you want to have a particular feeling and have gratified. It can be with drugs and alcohol and getting that type of feeling. That would be a lust of the flesh. That's a lust that would be um, of the world. Right. And then I would put music in that same category as having that same type of fulfillment of fleshly lust, that that's of the world. And in addition to that, you can see who is who is putting out all of this music. Where is it originating from? Where is it coming from? The sounds of the music, the genres of the music, where are they coming from? What is the source? The source is of the world. I believe that godly music is in its own genre. That there is a, a particular style or type of music that God likes. And see, anytime I preach this, people want to get like, they want to nail you down and say like, well, what about this progression and these chords? And what if you do this? And, you know, like, I'm not going to get into all those details, but honestly, I don't know where the line is, but it's the same reason why I don't know exactly where the line is, where God considers hair to be long and where he considers it to be short. So when the Bible says that a man ought not to have long hair, it's the same type of people that want to go, well, what's long? Well, I mean, can I have it below my ear? Well, can I have it down to my shoulder? Well, can I have it past my shoulder? You know, it's like, look, you're asking the wrong questions. Okay, when, when the Bible says that we ought not to love the things of the world. We don't want to see how close to the world that we could possibly get. How close to the, what being sinful can we possibly get because I just want to toe that line. You ought to be thinking, well, what is God just like? And let me stay far away from stuff that I know is of the world. I'm not going to be making Christian rap and Christian metal and Christian, I mean, just, just because I'm changing the lyrics when the songs and the music and the power that it has is still influencing you to be in a, a wicked state of mind.
Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, just to further demonstrate this point. And I'm already taking a little bit too much time on this than I had planned. 1 But the, the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because it's, music has had such a strong, a profound impact on my life. It had such a strong pull. And one of the things that I've noticed personally, just within my own life, after I was saved, knowing that there's certain music and songs and things that I know that are just bad, when I would listen to those songs anyways, even though I knew they were bad, it would always cause me or lead me into other sins. Always. And it took a while before I can see the pattern happening. Because even when I was trying to do things right and trying to do, you know, and, and getting rid of other sins, I would catch myself and I would think back and go, you know what? I knew I shouldn't have restarted listening to that music again because when I did that, all of a sudden I started getting into other things. Oftentimes it's things that the music's talking about or it's things that were related when you're listening to music because it ties in events and, and memories and other things and, and just, there's so much to it. There's so much to it. It's not just completely harmless. But to demonstrate, even from the scripture of how powerful music can be, we have this story in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And of course, the story is the story of King Saul when he wasn't right with God. When the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and, and rested upon King David, before he was king, of course, Saul, the, the, the Lord then was troubling Saul with an evil spirit. And the reason why he was doing that is because he's trying to get Saul's attention because Saul was a believer in the Lord. Saul was a saved individual and he was going down the wrong path and God was trying to get him back and he had made some bad choices and God is, is you know, troubling him and vexing him with this evil spirit. But the, the goal is going to be for the repentance of Saul to get right with God, right? Saul should have been grieved by being troubled by this evil spirit. He should have been, man, this is, something's not right. I need to do, you know, I need to fix this problem. And he goes to his counselors, so we're going to read that in the story. But the counsel they give him is like taking a drug to fix a problem where it's going to mask the symptoms for a while, but it doesn't go to the root of the problem, right? When you have a headache, you want to figure out why do you have a headache. You don't want to just take Tylenol to just, well, I'm going to temporarily make the headache go away. I mean, if you have a headache because you're dehydrated, well, the headache's not going to ultimately go away until you rehydrate yourself. You've got to fix the problem. Because as soon as that Tylenol wears off, guess what? That headache's going to come back. It's going to come back even worse. Fix the real problem. Don't mask the symptoms. What Saul does here is he masks the symptoms of not being right with God, but he does so in a way by using music. And this demonstrates the power that this music has against an evil spirit from the Lord. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubled So they knew this. They knew this is from God. They knew it's this evil spirit from the Lord. And they say to Saul, in verse 16, Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp, and it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. So that'll fix you right up. We'll have this guy with a cunning, he's a real good player on a harp. A harp's a good instrument, right? We already know that, that this is a good instrument. It's the right thing. And they end up getting David. Look at verse 23. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So is this something that actually happened or not? Do we believe as Bible believers that there was an evil spirit from the Lord that was troubling Saul? Do you believe that? I believe that. I believe it was real. I believe there was an evil spirit from the Lord troubling Saul. Do you believe that that spirit departed when David played this instrument with his music and that Saul was actually refreshed for it? I believe that happened. And it was the result of the music that David played. Do you think now David was playing good music or bad music? I think he was probably playing good music. He's using an instrument that we know is approved. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the instrument. There's nothing wrong with the harp. He was playing this. It doesn't say anything about him singing or lyrics. It just says, it talks about him playing. The music was enough to cause the spirit, the evil spirit to leave. I think this is an example of good music driving away an evil spirit. Now, 
that wasn't the right solution for Saul. But the reason why I'm pointing this out is to demonstrate the power that music has spiritually. Spiritually. So if the right music has that type of power to drive away an evil spirit, doesn't it hold or wouldn't it at least make sense that the wrong music can attract evil spirits, can bring in bad things? You know, instead of doing good, it can, it can actually do... I believe that wholeheartedly. And this is an example of why I believe that to be true in addition to just other anecdotal evidence and seeing it playing out in life, right? Which, I, again, I'm not saying that that is the primary source of my evidence, but when you start to see these patterns and you're applying biblical principles and you can see this stuff in real life, I think it, it still stands to reason that, that that does and can happen. And I say all of this just to warn you that the type of music, even if you can say, well, I don't find anything wrong with these lyrics. Well, is it music that's of the world? And should we be loving the things of the world? I mean, are these guys saved? Do you even know if they're saved? Do they go to church? I mean, is there any reason to think that these guys are saved? Do they have any testimony of salvation at all? And not only that, I, I wouldn't even stop at that. I mean, just, be, just because someone may be saved, if they're just living a completely unrighteous life, I mean, are you still going to really want to be following that person and listening to them and being entertained by that person and everything else? You know, there's some people who would claim that Elvis Presley was saved. I don't know that I even buy that, but there's at least a testimony out there that he did, you know, get saved. But a womanizer, a drug addict, a, you know, this guy that's abusing alcohol and he's singing songs like, like My Way, who, who uh, in the song itself says that, that he you know, he's, he's doesn't have the words of one who kneels. Talking about one who kneels down to God and prays, like, I did things, my, that whole song is about, well, I did it my way, right? And taking pride that, hey, I'm not like these people who kneel down and pray to God and do things God's way, I did it my way. And that's what that song is all about. So yeah, you could say, yeah, but he sang these gospel songs and everything else. Yeah, but he also sang that garbage too. And you can see by the way he lived his life that... You know, that is not someone that I want to be listening to and getting all the, you know, thinking that that's just as awesome praise and glory to the Lord. Because I'll tell you what, that God, I'm sure, much more enjoys the youth that loves God and is going to sing out and doesn't have the beautiful voice that Elvis Presley has, but is singing with his heart to the Lord and is doing his best to live a righteous life and obeying the, the law of the Lord. And God is going to be way more satisfied and way more pleased with that person who's doing that than he's going to be with some famous drug addict, drunk, that happens to be blessed with a great voice, but then gets off into all manner of sin, and if he was saved, has a terrible testimony, and then every once in a while may throw a, throw a, a you know, give a nod to God and sing a gospel song or something, or make a gospel album. while he's just, just living in wickedness and sin. Let's go back to Psalm 33. Man, I got it. Didn't want that to have to happen. I've been preaching for a while already, but this is it's an important subject. One last point, though, on the subject of music. Going back to now this, the right kind of music. Verse number three of Psalm 33 says, Sing unto him a new song. And again, this is, uh, this is referenced in other psalms as well. I'll sing unto the Lord a new song. This goes hand in hand with not loving the things of the world. Right? When you get saved and if you want to praise the Lord, and, you know, it ought to be a new song. It ought to be a different song. It ought, it ought not to sound like Led Zeppelin being brought into church. It ought to be a new song. Sing unto him a new song, and look at this, play skillfully with a loud noise. Multiple things here. Play skillfully. Don't treat, if, you, if you're going to play an instrument in church, why don't you learn to do it really well? You know, it's one of the reasons why Brother Peter is our song leader here at church. You know, early on when I was, when I was trying to get people, you know, getting people filling different positions and doing different things within church, and we had our, um, 
you know, preaching classes and stuff, and I was teaching guys how to do this. And, and forgive me, Brother Peter, for, for using you as an example here. I don't want to you know, embarrass you or anything, but you know, Brother Peter wasn't the most talented with his voice when we were in the preaching class. And just being honest. But you know what he did have? He had a desire to want to do things right and cared about doing things right and being skillful with it and practiced it and had a desire and really wants to serve God and went above and beyond our own, you know, the teaching and things within the class to go and continue to do things. Why? Because he thought it's important. Because when you're going to get up in front of the church and do a job, he wants to do it right. And that's an attitude that we all ought to have. If you want to do, you know, play an instrument or even just sing, how about we practice? How about you practice your singing at home? Why don't you try to do whatever you're doing skillfully? Why don't you do it with all of your heart and care about it and try to do your best for God? Amen. Play skillfully and play skillfully with a loud noise. God doesn't want you being, you know, it's like we're not praising to God in secret. We're not going underground to praise the Lord. And all right, everyone keep your voices down. We're going to praise God. He wants you to praise God with a loud voice, with a loud noise, with a, you know, play skillfully and play out. I'm sure God loved having, you know, what was it, 120 trumpeters. Man, that's a loud noise. Making a, making a song of praise unto the Lord. God likes that. He wants, he wants the excitement. He wants the, the, the praise being played skillfully with a loud noise. That, that, this is, you know, this is how music to God ought to be. It's not patterned after the world. It's a new song played skillfully with a loud noise. But let's, uh, let's keep going here. Verse number four, the Bible reads, For the, the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. I, I mean, you know what God loves? God loves righteousness. You know what else God loves? God loves judgment. God loves judgment. And we're living in a world today where people say, oh, don't judge. Don't. God loves judgment. God loves justice. God loves equity. God loves these things being right in the world. God set up a law so that we can try to, to have things done right in the world. God loves that. I love that. We ought to love that. Verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Now, this is not just a song using poetic language to describe the creation of the earth saying, oh, you know, the, by the word of the Lord or the heavens made. That's actual truth in fact and literal. That that is how everything was created. And, and this is so interesting that, you know, atheists and, and Bible deniers might want to scoff. Oh, you just think that words created the earth and everything. It's like, but you have no idea and you have no way of showing or demonstrating or proving. And the farther back they try to look with all of their instruments and technology, they have zero explanation of where did everything come from. Other than it just came from nothing. You're going to scoff at God speaking it into existence, which means it came like from, but it actually had a source because it came from God. But, you know, there was nothing beforehand and then God created it all. This, you know, these atheists will tell you there was nothing before and then it all exploded, nothing exploded, and then we have everything. That's not ridiculous, though. That's science. But God speaking and making it so, that's just crazy to talk, right? You're just a lunatic for believing that and, and how silly and uneducated you are. But look at Genesis chapter 1, just showing you. I mean, the very first chapter of the Bible tells us that Everything was made, the heavens were made by the word of the Lord. And, you know, a host of them is just, you know, a multitude, a, you know, a bunch of them by the breath of his mouth. Genesis 1, verse 3, the Bible says, And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 6, And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, let it divide the waters from the waters. Verse 9, And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And I don't have all of it. If you keep reading these verses, every single time when it says, and God said, like verse 11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass. And then it says at the end of the verse, and it was so. God said, and it was so. Verse 14, God said, let there be lights and firm in the heaven. Guess what? And it was so. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firm of heaven. And guess what? It was so. 
Verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God created everything by the word of his mouth, the word of his voice. He spake everything into existence. God said, and it was so. Amen. What a great truth that is. And of course, we know that the Bible also attributes, you know, it says that God said, the word of the Lord said, but in John 1, the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. We know the word to be Jesus Christ because further down in chapter 1, it says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, so full of grace and truth. <coughs> That's Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father. And it says in verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Isn't it interesting how John 1 says that calls Jesus the Word, and it's and it's the Word that created everything, and God literally said, Let there be light, and let you know, let all these things happen. And Jesus is the source, uh, you know, Jesus is the Word. And Jesus is attributed with created everything, creating everything here. Uh, you, and you can say, you know, some people will say that don't fully understand the Trinity. Like, well, wait a minute. I thought the Bible talks about the Father creating everything. And the Bible does talk about the Father creating things too. But when you have the triune God working in unison, they all can have the credit of creation especially when you look at just how the bible says that things happen right so if if the god said let there be light and it was like literally jesus of the trinity you know bringing forth that light god if the father commands it and and Jesus makes it so they're both have their hand in creation and have can have creation attributed to them. Does that make sense? Like if I tell if I tell one of my children to go do something for someone else, it wouldn't be wrong for them to come back and thank me for doing that for them. Right? Someone else may have been the physical hands, but the authority of the, the word came from me to make something happen. Which wouldn't have happened otherwise. Right? So Yes, my child can be attributed with, with doing that, right, with, with making that happen, but then I also can be attributed with making that happen. That's, you know, that's not some contradiction or some problem. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, actually, I'm going to skip over Colossians chapter 1. There's just, again, it's just more verses about creation. I, I, I'd spent too much time on the, the first part of the sermon. Let's go back to Psalm 33. Another truth for another day. Well, same truth for another day. Colossians 1. Psalm 33, verse 7, the Bible reads, He gathereth the, water, the waters of the sea together as in heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. And again, I think this is something that people have a tendency to forget about, just the power and the, and the almightiness of God. The Bible says here, he gathereth the waters of the sea together as in heap. Like, it sounds great in, in, a, in a song or just reading it, but I mean, think about, think about how heavy water is. Do you ever fill up a bucket with water and, and try to carry it? Do you, ever, do you ever fill up a bucket that was too big and you had too much water in it and you have to like let some out because it's, you just physically can't carry it? How little volume of water is that? And even the strongest man in the world, how much volume of water can he actually carry? Not much. Not much. And this is talking about the Lord, you know, gathering the waters of the sea together as in heap and, and laying up the depth in storehouse, just like, yep, I got a storehouse for all this water and, you know, just... Just, move, just doing what he will with it. Let all the earth fear the Lord. You can't just do that. <laughs> God, God is all-powerful and almighty. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done. 
We serve a God that's like, he doesn't have to break a sweat to do anything. He can speak and, and matter is created and things exist. He can speak and life can cease to exist. I mean, what God will can be done. And we ought to stand in awe of that, of him, and fear the Lord and, and give him the reverence and respect that's due to him. For he spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. Verse 10, the Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever the thoughts of his heart to all generations and again i think this is this this is a testament to the word of the lord the counsel of the word coming from the word of god says it stands forever you can't you cannot um you know it's never going to go away it stands forever and the thoughts of his heart to all generations we have the thoughts of god's heart that is preserved to all generation because his word never dies his word never ends his word is eternal and everlasting, and it stands forever, and he's going to make sure that we have access to his, to all, that all generations have access to his word, because it's the word of God that saves. Verse 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. And, you know, this, I believe, this is why the United States of America has been as blessed as it has been. Because the United States of America is a nation whose God has been the Lord. Now, we don't act anymore like a Christian nation, but the way that the country was founded, and look, I'm not saying that there haven't always been evil rulers and evil people and, and bad influences, and I'm not saying that, that everyone has been perfect and there hasn't been evil. Look, it's always been around. However, however, there is still a stark contrast between how this country, especially in the past, has stood by the word of the Lord and the Bible and has stood for these principles and has stood for these morals and has exalted the name of Jesus Christ and has done work to go out and preach the gospel and has tried to spread the gospel into all the world. The amount of work that has been done from this country is... is you know, there's been not the like of it in recent history at all for who knows how long. I don't want to say it's the best ever in history. I don't know that. I don't know how much good has been done in, let's say, in, in Israel, pre-Jesus Christ Israel. So I don't know. But I do know that in the United States of America, the, that God, the Lord, has been exalted as the God of this nation. And you're right. It's sad. It's, it's, it's been turning. And you know what? We're going to face destruction as the people, even as the children of Israel did, when they turned their back on the Lord and they gave lip service to the Lord, but they just weren't following anymore. And they're going to the groves and they're making their own idols and making their own gods and going after the way of the heathen. That's what's happening now. We see more influence coming from Islam and from Buddhism and from every other religion. Just, just people, even Christians, is getting influenced by all this other wickedness and these false gods out there. Well, you know what? God's going to bring his judgment down as a result. But I love this statement that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord because, you know, this nation has been blessed of God. There's no doubt about it that this country and this nation have been blessed by God. And it's the result of the, of the forefathers of the people who had been doing that great work and the people who just claimed the Lord to be their God. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse number 5. This was the instructions given you know, by God through Moses unto the children of Israel about keeping his law and keeping his statutes and that as a country, as a nation, if you're to keep the laws of God, that the other nations, that other people out of the world are going to look to you and say, wow, what a wise, what a wise nation that is. What, what a great country that is. They have so much understanding to have laws like that in place. This is what it says. Look at verse number five of Deuteronomy 4. The Bible says, behold, I have taught you statutes, excuse me, and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land where you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes 
and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all the law which I set before you this day? This, I tell you what, you don't have to know anything about the history of the nation of the children of Israel that instituted these laws and, and have to know, well, did that really happen? Yes, it happened. This is what the Bible says would happen if you embrace the laws of the Lord, the laws that God has commanded. And you know what this is? These are, this includes all the Levitical laws, the laws in Leviticus, the laws in Deuteronomy, the laws that God has given, the Old Testament laws that today so-called Bible believers you know, are afraid to even bring up or mention or think that, oh, no, we can't believe that stuff. The Bible says, you know what, the, the, the nation that holds to these things, all the other nations, now, you know what, all the other nations, when he's saying this, none of them were followers of the Lord. They all had their own gods. But you know what he said? If you ex embrace my laws and my rules, they're all going to see that and they're going to say, wow, that's why these people are wise. They actually have really good laws in place. This is actually this is actually a nation that has God, you know, real close to them. You could say, well, how can that be? I don't even understand that because if they don't even follow the Lord, why would they care what their laws are? Well, you know what? That's what God said would happen, and it does happen. And you know what? That's what happened in this country too. When you look back at the laws of the land, now the laws have all changed. The punishments have all changed. What's, what's legal and illegal has changed over the years, which is just a sign of how far removed we've gotten from the laws of the Lord. But when you go back to the foundation, even before the Constitution was written, you go back to the colonies, and you look at the Confederation of States, and you look at these different things, they had laws against sodomy, they had laws against rape, they had laws against kidnapping, they had the death penalty placed on those things. You can see them written in the books because it's historical evidence and shows you, and then you want to know why so many people wanted to come to this great nation is because this great nation once had laws that followed the Bible laws. Amen. That's why. And, and, and we see it played out. What nation is there so great? Why did so many people want to immigrate here and flood here? Because we had righteous laws. Because the Lord was our God and even people from heathen lands could recognize and say, wow, I want to be a part of that nation. Because they have righteousness. They have judgment. They know what wickedness is and they know what righteousness is and they're going to punish the wickedness and they're going to exalt the righteousness and that's what they're living by and that's what their laws state. I want to go and join myself to be a part of that nation. And that is how the people will view you when you do that. That's what happened to this country. That's why God blessed this country because it, it had so many people that exalted the Lord and the laws went along to show it and we were blessed. And now all of a sudden, things have changed and we're in the era of, you know, Solomon's children that grew up having everything so great and grew up having all fed and have no idea why and are going to just continue to, to, you know, go off a cliff, as it were. We got the Rehoboams and worse. People are so afraid these days. I mean, God's saying, you know what? If you had laws like Leviticus 2013, you know, other nations would see that and you wouldn't be the laughing stock of the nations. But these days, you know, people are so afraid in the United States of America to say anything against the queers and the fags and say that, oh man, I'm, I don't know what they're going to do. And, and you have to pretend like you're all so we're, we're so enlightened now and we're just going to embrace filth and wickedness and, and all manner of perversion and try to exalt this as some great virtue. You know why the nations of the world hate us? That's one of the reasons right there. You think you're so great and you're so trendy and people are just going to love you so much. The only people who are going to love you are the wicked people in this country. The people of the world are looking around and going, you guys are nuts. You're nuts to be, to be promoting that level of filth and perversion and wickedness. Who, have, who wants to have anything to do with a country like that? You're, you guys are crazy. You've got people, you got people defiling children and you send them off to prison for a couple years and then they're back on the streets again. You guys are nuts. You're out of your mind. 
You let, you let predators like that just go instead of, instead of putting them out of their misery and putting them to death and sending them straight to hell. Amen. People got it backwards. What, what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 4 would still work today if this country decided to say, you know what, we're going to be a country that, that follows the Lord. We're going to look to the laws of the Lord to, to be instituted in our country because we fear the Lord, we love the Lord, and we're going to serve the Lord. And, and all the nations around are going to see that and go, that's a wise nation. And I'm not talking about the wicked leaders in power in other nations. I'm talking about the people. Because that's what really matters anyways. It's not the, 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 the wickedness, the spiritual wickedness in high places. Because that's also not who God was talking about either in Deuteronomy 4. He wasn't thinking that, you know, the king of Babylon was going to say, oh, wow, what a wise nation. They're going to hate him. But you know what? The Chaldeans or the rest of the Babylonians are going to look and go, wow, what a, what a righteous nation. Wow, what a people that's close to God. They actually have good laws. Because usually it's just the people in the high places that are the oppressors and in general the people want to have the freedom and they want to have righteousness and they want to have judgment. They want things to just be right. I mean, how great would that be to live in a world where when people do things that are just really wicked or, or anything, any crime that's done, that there's a just recompense of, of judgment and punishment being served. Wouldn't that be great? So if people actually do something wrong, they're guilty, they actually have to pay a, a, a righteous judgment. Not one that's, that's overblown because someone just doesn't like it and ends up being, you know, just, just having their life destroyed over a small crime. But on the, and on the flip side, you don't have people just getting away with murder and not having a life for a life. If we just have that level of justice, man, what a, what a great place to live. That, see, if I saw another country doing that, I'd be like, I want to move there. Where, where can that happen, right? As it is, as it stands right now, I think we're in the best place we could be. Honestly, I still think, I mean, with all the problems the United States of America has in general and the wickedness and stuff, I still think this is the best place to be that may be the closest, <laughs> which is a far cry, still may be the closest. And that's just a, a, you know, a, a sad reflection on, on how the world is going. Either way, come Lord Jesus. All right, Psalm 33. I'm almost done. Let's, let's try to wrap this up. I'm on my last page of notes here. Psalm 33, verse 13. The Lord looketh from heaven, and he, behold, he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. God's up in heaven. He sees everything that everybody does. But here's something that's interesting, and, and, and I want to touch on this. God fashions the heart of man. He fashions the heart of man all alike. This is another reason why I think racism, racism is so stupid. You know, there's people who think that there's, you know, certain people are less evolved or certain people are cursed or whatever and it's dumb because you know what god fashions the heart of man the same yeah. fashions the heart of man. it doesn't matter where you're born it doesn't matter what color your skin is it doesn't matter where you're from god made your hearts the same you all have the same in in, in essence opportunity because y'all we've all been built with um with these hearts now they're physical hearts they're fleshly hearts but no one's made worse than another. You can choose and you can, you, you can make the choices in your life on whether or not you're going to have a wicked heart or not. You're going you're gonna to go down that path and, and let your heart, a wicked heart lead you or not. God considers all their works. Verse 16, There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. This is a great truth also. It says here in verse 17, And horse is a vain thing for safety, neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. At the end of the day, you know, saying a king is not saved by the multitude of an host, it doesn't matter how big your army is. The United States of America doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how big the army, navy, air force, marines, doesn't matter 
how it doesn't matter if every single person in the United States of America was conscripted to fight in some military and we had more people than than in all other countries combined in our military that doesn't matter because safety is of the Lord that you, you, you don't let that fake sense of strength and comfort and peace make you think you know that that, that oh man we've got the you know people are so proud we've got the greatest military and we've got the weapons and we've got the body. you know what if God's not with us you better be scared you better be afraid because that stuff is going to do nothing for you. The Bible says here a horse is a vain thing for safety. Vain, vain means it's meaningless. Now, when it's talking about a horse here, you know, without, that, that would be like the tank of today. You know, for, for the, the warfare at the time when this is written, hey, a horse was a, a very valuable, you know, addition to your, to your strength, to your force, right? Because people on horseback and, you know, that's a lot more versatile. You get, you know, you got the advantage on other people. You could, you know, you, you could do a lot more damage and it's just, it's just a lot more valuable to have on your side. But you know what he's saying? It's a vain thing for safety. And he's not going to deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. We need to be trusting as a Lord, to the Lord as our strength. And when God's going to be against you, it doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter how many people you have defending you, protecting you. It doesn't matter if you have a bunker in the mountains and you've got everything perfectly sealed off and you've got your doomsday stuff and you've got your prepper things and you've got, you know, 10,000 rounds and all the guns and ammo and gold and silver and food and water and shelter. You can have all of that stuff built up and if God is against you, guess what? The breath of your mouth is in his hand and he could just, you're done. You're gone in an instant. Doesn't matter. We need not to be so worried about the vain things and the vain, you know, oh, but we've got this great army. And that's why, you know what? Look, the Bible says in Psalm 20, we saw this, you know, a few weeks ago or, you know, a month, a couple months ago, whatever. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. You know, some people out there, they just want to put all their effort into having the chariots, the horses. There's some people out there, they're going to, you know, they're just focused on getting the guns and getting the security cameras and getting all this other, you know, it's like, you know what, I'm going to remember the name of the Lord our God. Now, it doesn't make those things bad things. It doesn't make the horse a bad thing. It doesn't make the chariot a bad thing. It doesn't make those things bad to have. But where is your trust? Are you seeking to the Lord? Do you fear the Lord? Are you going to the Lord? Are you trusting in him to be your defense? Yeah, have the other stuff. The Bible says in Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. There's nothing wrong about having the horse ready to go. There's nothing wrong about having the gun ready to go. Jesus said, hey, you know, sell, if you don't have a sword, sell your garment and get one. And they said, behold, we have two. And he's like, you know what? That's enough. They had two swords. Like, that's good. You didn't need to stockpile them. You don't need the whole arsenal. Good. Good. You, know, you get the sword. You may need the defense. But your trust needs to be in the Lord. You can have the, the horse prepared for the day of battle. It's ready to go. You know, I've, got, I've got my firearm. It's ready to go. It's loaded for the day of battle. But you know what? When I'm walking around town, when I'm going places, when I'm serving the Lord, when I'm doing whatever, I'm not trusting in that firearm. I'm not trusting in the gun, in the bullets. I'm trusting in the Lord. I may have it because it's wise to have something like that, but that is not where my trust is. Psalm 33, verse 20, the Bible says, Our soul waiteth for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. And that, you know, that, that sums it up, that our hope is in the Lord. We're trusting in the Lord. He's our deliverer. You know, there's, there's, so, there's so many things. It's, it, sometimes it's frustrating running out of time. Um, I could go on and on and on. What a great psalm. There's so many great truths here. Hopefully you learned something tonight. Hopefully, you know, um, if I want you to walk away with anything, though, it's, you know, the, the point that I had made earlier about looking to the, to the word of the Lord for all, for all things in our life, for all aspects, and, and try to gauge 
what's right and what's not right based on what the Bible says and try to apply these truths. And the more you learn from the Word of God, continue to try to apply them in your life and take the time to re-examine things that you may get used to doing. You may f you know, form different habits and you may have different forms of entertainment or, or the way that you spend your time. From time to time, reevaluate the things that you do against Scripture and, and judge, right? Make righteous judgment and see, is this right? And have the heart that's not trying to get away with as much as you possibly can to justify, to try to justify sin, but have the heart of, you know what? This is what the Bible, this is the direction that the Bible's teaching me to go, and this is the way that's going to be the way of righteousness. So I'm just going to focus on those things. And if these other things aren't really lining up with that, then I'm going to ditch those other things and continue to try to follow in the path of righteousness and, and not see, well, how much can I possibly get away with and still be in the path of righteousness? Because even just having that heart and that attitude is going to start to cause you to backslide. Just, just having that heart alone means that your heart isn't fully <laughs> in the right place to serve God with. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great truths. Your, your psalms are so packed with great truth and knowledge, dear Lord. Help us to continue to learn and to grow. And Lord, none of us are perfect, but we, we do love you. We care about you. We want, we want to serve you better, Lord. We, we need the understanding. Help us to be able to apply the truths that we can learn from your word into our daily lives so that we're not getting involved in sin and wickedness um, unknowingly or ignorantly, dear Lord. Help us to be able to apply your words. And God, we love you. And it's in Jesus Christ's holy name that we pray these things. Amen.